would you join me in this prayer that we kind of say together before we look to the Word of God? Would you join me today? Profiles. No. <laughs> Read this with me. We ask that the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and make us into the image of the Son of God. I kind of want to start with a little softball question today for you. Um, and I just want you to be honest. How many of you have... Um, You've made an excuse to get out of doing something. How many of you have done that? I'm going to change my text. All liars shall have their place in the lake that burneth with fire. Okay. Of course you have, right? Like we've all come in a, into a moment in our life where we've made an excuse because we just didn't really want to do something. Let me go a little deeper here, right? How many have gotten really good at this? Oh, we got some people that are willing to admit it. Like, it's one thing to admit it, like, okay, I've done that before. It's another thing to say, I do that, because it's like, that does not sound like a good thing, right? Uh, being an, an excuse maker, but we've all done it, and we've all made excuses, sometimes for our behavior, for our lack of effort, uh, maybe for our selfishness, um, our apathy, Right? Or we've made excuses because of our circumstances. Um, maybe it's because of other people's actions in our lives. We found ourselves in a place where it becomes a, a, an excuse for us. Um, I found an article about the most ridiculous excuses of missing work. And I'm not going to read them all to you. I had a couple favorites. I did like this one. An employee got stuck in the blood pressure machine at the grocery store and could not get out. So that's why he called in. And an employee caught their uniform on fire by putting it in the microwave to dry. Um, so, yeah, in case you thought you could do that, don't do that. You learned something today. My favorite one, though, was in this list was an employee woke up in a good mood and didn't want to ruin it. So they called in to work. <laughs> I mean, is that just the best? <laughs> like, not going to make it today. I'm in a good mood. I don't want to ruin it. <laughs> you know, in this profile series... The guy I want us to look at and learn from today had a master's degree in excuse making. He had a master's degree in excuse making. You know, the scriptures are full of instruction, right? A lot of, uh, of scriptures that are just instructional in nature. We, we think of the wisdom literature, the Proverbs and the Psalms, and there's encouragement and there's, there's, there's warnings, there's commands in scripture, right? It's got a little bit of everything, but you know what runs through scripture at the center of what it is, is it's, it's a narrative. It's a story, right? The, the most vibrant story in all the scripture is the life of Jesus. Uh, God revealing himself in complete revelation. This is who I am, and this is what I feel about you, and this is how I'm going to act towards you, and Jesus is the culmination of that. But actually, the revelation of God was told through the lives of men and women, not unlike you. That's how God wants us to understand himself. He, he had recorded and he interacted with men and women just like you and me to help us understand him. In fact, that's why I like this, this series statement we, that I've crafted for this series. It's God uses the stories of others to inform our story with him. I, I'm going to be honest. I, I, I've, I've obviously spent a lot of time reading this book and there's a lot of things that um, I've learned and commands, but the greatest instruction for me oft, oftentimes has been in the lives of those who are in the, in the scriptures. I mean, David, Noah, Moses, Abraham, they just like, the way their lives went gives me so much hope and encouragement. It gives me so much instruction. It, it gives me warning. And, and uh, that's why God, uh, Romans says, that all the things that have been recorded in scripture are to give us hope. So this morning, as we look at one of those profiles, I, I just ask you that, like, when you think of the name of Moses, what comes to your mind? How many of you, this is what comes to your mind? Like, 30 and younger, you're like, nope, not at all. But, like, I, this is what comes to my mind. Like, I'm probably going to meet Moses in heaven and be disappointed, right? Like, you're not like Charleston Heston. Like... That's Moses to me, right? The, the, the iconic movie of our culture, Moses. And um, look, most of us know his name, but I do want to take a quick journey through his bio. 
Because honestly, Moses' life could be a whole series in and of itself. Okay? I mean, but I really picked this pivotal place where I think that you and I can identify the most with Moses. Because I'm going to be honest, I don't identify with Moses like, you know, I think of him as he's, he's in the C-suite of the kingdom of God, right? He's up there in the executive level. Um, the guy who had the Ten Commandments given to him, who parted, who part, the, the Red Sea was parted as he facilitated that. Um, he's like, we're not even on the same wavelength until you begin to realize the way his life went. So I picked this pivotal moment, but let's just walk through quickly because I've learned that sometimes we either don't know the stories or we forgot the details of the stories. And so let's take a five-minute run through his life. Uh, if you remember, uh, God calls out this, this man, Abraham, to start a nation, the Jews, that ultimately Jesus is going to come through. Um, they had a specific time and purpose. Now, God made specific promises to them that he's still in the the. the, the process of fulfilling but really they were just a vehicle to bring us to what is really God's people it's his church right the people who are in Christ uh, but Abraham is um is is called out and and you know then Isaac and and Jacob and this this group of people start to form and we get to Joseph a son of Jacob and um, Joseph is used by God through bad circumstances in his life, terrible circumstances in his life, to be placed in the right position so that when the, a famine hits the, the land where the Jewish people live, that Joseph's in place already in Egypt, the superpower of the world at that time. He's risen to the prime minister position where he's able to rescue his people, his family and his people from extinction in the starvation. And so... God's people find themselves in Egypt because that's just where circumstantially they've landed. And they start to, um, to settle down there amongst the Egyptian people in that empire. And they start to have families and have kids and they begin to explode in number. They begin to explode in number so much that the Egyptians begin to wonder, Pharaoh begins to wonder, wow, there's a lot of these people in our country. And if they just have a mind one day to say, hey, I think we're going to take over this country, it seems like it's heading that direction. And so Pharaoh, while he can, uh, decides to make the, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, slaves. And in fact, one of his prohibitive measures, it was drastic, he decides to slow down the population. And he decides to do that by killing all newborn uh, Jewish males. Right? It's, 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 it's uh, next level. And yet, Moses' parents, who just had Moses in this time, sought to, to, to save him, to at least try to preserve his life. And, and if you remember, they hide him uh, <clears throat> uh, in the Nile, right? In the river, which is, is insane if you watch the Nile today on documentaries. I'm like, wow. Like, that would be a snack for a crocodile, it seemed like. But they hid him in a, a, a basket. And they had his sister keep an eye on him through the day. And they're trying, right? And um, as it would happen, and again, coincidence is not in God's deal, okay? Um, Pharaoh's own daughter comes down to the river to bathe and to, to take care of herself, whatever. And um, she hears the cry of the baby. And... She opens the thing, and her heart's captured by this precious little baby, and she doesn't have it in her heart. to. She, she wants him. And so she decides to take him back. Now, in the details of that story, Moses' sister Miriam and his mom become like his nursemaids, his caretakers, like do the hard stuff, the diaper changing and all that stuff for Pharaoh's daughter. And, and that's how Moses is raised. A Jewish kid who ends up living in the palace of Egypt. Uh, at the same time, he has his mom and his sister who are pouring into him every day. Teaching him about who he was, where he came from. This is his story. He, 
just receives favor, um, as only God can do and does do. And Moses, um, he grows up. In fact, Stephen says this about Moses in the book of Acts, that Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in speech and action. What is said of Moses from history is that he was a military general. He was a military genius. He was educated. He was like a professor type kind of guy. He was a diplomat for Egypt with other countries. Culturally, he was on the cutting edge. He was very cultured. This is a well-rounded man who has grown in favor of Pharaoh and his family and uh, maybe there's a chance that he's heir to the throne one day. He's just in that small circle of people. That's the first 40 years of Moses' life that is recorded. But there's this pivotal moment at the age of 40 when Moses is out and about. And he sees one of the Egyptian slave owners taking to task one of the Jewish men, beating him, abusing him. And something in Moses happens. Hebrews says it this way about Moses in the faith chapter. He says that Moses, when he grew up, something inside of him refused to be treated as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer the oppression of God's people instead of the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah or his people than own the treasures of Egypt. And he had somehow in his mind developed a mentality to look ahead to the great reward that God would give him. So in this moment, as a prince of Egypt, yet knowing his identity and seeing the injustice and, and, and identifying with that Jewish man, he does what he can and he kills the Egyptian slave owner. And then the next day he realizes that the news has gotten out of what he's done. And it's going to become clay, clear to Pharaoh that he has a son whose allegiance is somewhere else. And so Moses flees. I mean, the superpower of the world, he goes to the place where maybe no one will find him. He runs to the desert. And Moses' story for 40 years is living in the desert. The next 40 years of his life are living in the desert. In that time, he finds a wife. He marries into a family business, and he becomes a shepherd. He becomes a husband. He becomes a father. He has two boys. He settles down, and the glamour of his former life fades away. 40 years on the backside of the desert is Moses' story. In fact, I calculated it up. That's 14,600 days. That's 350,000 hours. He becomes an obscure, normal man who is long, a long way away from the life he once knew. You know, at 80 and his kind of equivalency for us, if he's two-thirds through his life, let's just understand things are different. You know, we, we eat processed food. He didn't and stuff like that. I'm kidding. You know, like, but it's like us being 55. Think of a man that's like 55 in our culture. At 55, you're starting to have thoughts of retirement. Yeah. Um, grandkids slowing down, settling down, right? That's Moses. When we come to this place where we want to pick up his story, where I think we can identify with Moses most, um, most intimately, most clearly. It's in Exodus chapter 3, if you have your Bible and you want to go there. Exodus 3 and 4 are the two chapters we're looking into today. It's uh, on the app or it's, it's on the screen. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There's so many detail in here that's so good, but it's for another time. There was the, then the, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. 
Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. This is the whole burning bush. If you've heard of the story of the burning bush in Scripture, it's referred to or you've seen imagery. This is it. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange thing. Surely he's seen a lot of bushes burn in the desert, right? Lightning strikes, it's so dry, it would just blow. But this one just keeps burning, and he's, he's, he's captivated by it. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the bush, Moses, and Mo- Moses, Moses. Now, obviously this guy had been on his own for a while because he talks back to the bush, right? Like, I'm not sure what I would have done here, but he did. He's like, oh, here, here I am, right? To which the Lord says, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. The place where you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And this, it begins to dawn on Moses what is happening. That God himself is talking to Moses. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Only God himself would do that, would say those words. Would identify with those people. And Moses, at this, he hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then he names who lives there now. And he says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, Moses. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, if I'm writing this movie, this is how it goes. Like this is the climactic point where Moses hears these words And across his face, there's just like this, he clenches his fists, like, yeah, I knew it. I knew something was going to happen. I knew, right? Like, I get my chance. It's like this satisfaction I would build into this story of him, like, it's time to go back and kick some butt and take some names. Right? I think I think that because I know the rest of Noah, Moses' story, right? It's easy for me to make that association because I know that this is the stand-up to Pharaoh, Moses. This is the facilitator of the ten plagues, Moses. This is the lead two million people out of Egypt, Moses. This is the part the Red Sea, Moses. The get the Ten Commandments, Moses. This is the strike the rock with his staff and water pours out, Moses. This is the write the first book, five books of the Bible, Moses. I know, but in that moment, the reality is this, that the desert had done a number on Moses. It had done a number. I want to tell you what, you you don't live life long to realize that life can do a number on you. As kids, we're full of dreams. As kids, we have the world by its tail. And we're going to be you know, an astronaut and a physics scientist and all the things all at once. And we live a little bit longer and life does a a number on us, doesn't it? I haven't met anybody yet that hasn't faced the reality that life is not quite what I thought it was going to be. You know, Moses is different. Life has shaped him The desert has done this. He doesn't think like he used to. Can you identify with these words? He's a realist. You ever said that about yourselves? We go from dreamers to realists real fast. He's a pragmatist. He's jaded by his bad choices. 
his failure, his broken dreams. And now he's just living in the reality of trying to make a living and raise a family. Amen, anybody? And so what I would have imagined that middle part of his story to look like, it goes way different than what it really did. The next part of the conversation is filled with all the reasons, excuses, why Moses is out of the game now. He's not the man. He's, an, he's not a brash young prince. He's an insecure, middle-aged shepherd. And he's no longer a man of action. He's a man who hesitates. Let's, let's, let's read through this. Because I think... In the five excuses of Moses, they encompass all the excuses that exist. And I think we need to see this about his life. My hope is that you grab a hold of the fact that Moses was not any different than you. And that life is still the same. The, the, The circumstances changes, the context, you know, we're not in deserts and shepherds. and But yet the realities of what is God going to do with my life still remain. And Moses sat at that pivotal moment just like you and I. It just didn't, voila, happen for him. We tend to romanticize these characters in Scripture where it's like, well, this is Moses. He wasn't going to do anything different. No, the story of his life tells us something way different. Listen, Listen to this. Moses says to God, God says, I'm going to use you. I want you to go. Who am I? Well, Moses, you used to be a military leader. You were an educator, a diplomat, a culture icon. I see the desert that totally washed that away. And now Moses is simply the man who just says, what? Me? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring bring the Egyptians out of Egypt? It's the identity excuse. I'm not good enough. Who am I? Right? Um, It's the, the reality that Moses' failure had become his identity. And so when God calls to him, his the only thing he can see is not me. Do you know my record? Do you know who I am? I'm the guy that took things in his own hands way too quickly. I'm the guy that ran and has stayed hidden. In fact, I'm kind of liking this now. You're going to find out later. Like, I don't want any. I just want to just be comfortable. Who am I? God, you're talking to the wrong. I'm not good enough for that. I'm pretty sure that I'm not good enough has been an excuse that's been repeated over and over, right? What I want to remind you of today is that I'm not, and you're not, going to lead two million people through a desert. And you're not going to part a Red Sea, okay? But God has a purpose for your life, just like he did for me. And he's calling to each one of us to lean in and live into that purpose. I don't know what it is for you. I mean, I know it is to bring the kingdom of God to this earth, but I don't know the specifics. But I do know that a lot of times that when God calls, we often have this excuse. God, not me. Do you know who I've been? Do you know how many times I've failed? Have you seen my record? Even if you don't have a real record, like you still have maybe a record of stops and starts, hot and cold. Failure, failure, failure. I'm not good enough, right? That's Moses right there that day at the burning bush. I mean, a bush is on fire and God's talking to him. I mean, I should do something for you, right? And all he can see still is, not me. This is how God responds to him. This is such the cool part of the story. God said, I'll be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who has sent you. Moses, I'm promising you right now, when you bring those people out of Israel, 
you're going to worship God on this very mountain with them. I've been thinking about this week. It's like, this is what God does. The I'm not good enough excuse is it's trash to God. You know, in my own life, those places where I've spectacularly failed at times, or they've been the weaknesses that have caused me to, to, to miss and, and, you know, mess up, sometimes have been the very places where God has brought the most purpose into my life. That's what God does. He takes our failure and he redeems it. And then he uses it. He's like, Moses, you've been on this, you've been in this desert getting used to it for 40 years. Well, you know what? I'm going to take the knowledge you have of the desert and you're going to use that as you lead people through it. Isn't that amazing? For 40 years he's lost, obscure, only to know that that very place is where he's going to bring 2 million people through. It's not going to be obscure anymore. I'm not good enough. God's got something for that. So Moses keeps going, right? That's what we do, right? God, Moses said to God, well, suppose I go and, and say to them, okay, I'm not good enough, and you're saying that's baloney. Um, well, then this is my next excuse. Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent you, and they ask me, well, what is his name? Then what shall I tell him? This is the intelligence excuse, right? Have you made this one before? I don't know enough. God, you want me to do this, but I don't know what I'm doing. To which God says, Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. So I don't know enough, right, is the excuse have you ever used that one before? And God's saying, okay, guess what I'm going to do, Moses? I'm going to introduce you to what has now become like the I am. <laughs> it's like, Moses, I can help you with that. I mean, think about it. If you made that excuse in life, you would have done nothing. I don't know enough. I would have never gotten married. I had no idea what I was doing. My wife's not in here. To, she said amen the first service, okay? <laughs> I didn't know. Right? If I'd have waited until I knew enough to be married, I'd have never gotten married. I, I've talked to so many of people, even in this room, that maybe you've started something new or you, you started a business. And, and it's funny to look at you. You laugh now. And like, when I started this, I had no idea what I was doing. But you did it. And God's like, the I don't know enough. Well, guess what? I'm going to just start by giving you like foundational stuff, Moses, that you can use. Like, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to help you every, like you're going to walk in there and you're going to say things that then now they're going to use for thousands of years later. In fact, the very Messiah of the world is going to start using the I am the good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am like... Moses, you're worried about not knowing enough, but guess what? I'm going to help you with that. I just want you to go, Moses. Right? You keep going. Chapter 4, Moses again answers, well, what if they don't believe me or listen to me? And say, the Lord did not appear to you. To me, this is a very plausible excuse, right? Some guy shows back up, he's 80 now, and he's saying, God talked to me in a burning bush. Like, this is the ineffective excuse. People won't believe me. This is the one I actually can be like, okay. Like, you're insane. You know, Moses knew what he was getting back into if he went. The elders of Israel, Pharaoh himself. And these are some smart cats. Like, how am I going to do this? And this is maybe the excuse that's been most intriguing to me. Because then the Lord said to him, Moses, what's that in your hand? A staff, he replies. The Lord says, throw it on the ground. So Moses throws it on the ground, and it becomes a snake. And he does what any sensible person would do. He ran. He runs from it. Then the Lord said to him, and this is where I would be out. <laughs> this is why Moses, Moses, I'm checked. 
Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. I ain't touching no snake. <laughs> Moses reached out and took hold of the snake. And it turned back into a staff. This, says the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord their God, the God of their fathers, has appeared to you. The Lord says, all right, Moses, that's not enough for you. Put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses puts his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put it back in. So Moses puts his hand back in, and when he took it out, it was restored. Now this is, again, where I would have taken my hand out and fainted. Like, oh, it's over. Moses takes it back out, and it's restored. And the Lord said, if they don't believe you or pay attention to these signs, the first or the second, but if they do not believe these two signs, take some water from the mile, pour it out on the dry ground, and the water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. And this is where I want us to lean a little bit in. People won't believe me. Honestly, that sounds like a pretty plausible excuse. And yet the Lord promises to do something in our heart. See, for Moses, it was outward, these outward miracles, right? They needed that stuff back then. They, they, they just, and yet the God who turns staffs into snakes and does an even greater work in our heart. And you know what? There's people that I knew in my past that wouldn't believe me. But now that I've walked with the Lord 20-something years, I'm different. You've got to believe that the Spirit of God can change who you are. That's the whole deal here. And he's saying, Moses, I get it. But when you start doing these kind of things, they're going to take note really fast. And they did, did they not? Plagues, and they just finally said, dude, God's with you. Get out of here. Can we believe that People won't believe us because of what they know about us or who they've seen. Or Can we believe that the power of God's grace in our life, changing us, strengthening us, becomes believable and becomes a living witness to a world around us? People won't believe us. Yeah, they won't until they see Christ in them. Moses keeps going, though. Pardon your servant, Lord. He's now getting to the point where he's apologizing about his excuses, right? I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and tongue. This is amazing to me because he was known for his power of speech and action in Egypt. But see, what the desert does is it distorts your reality. Life distorts your reality. Tough times difficult circumstances, you lose sight of who you can be. He's like, I don't have it in me. This is the I'm not talented enough excuse. The Lord says, okay, Moses, come on. Who gave human beings their mouths, deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. About by this time, Moses should start to get the idea that any of the excuses are not going to work. But he finally just goes back to the, the, the one like this. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please just send somebody else. It's the, just let me do my thing. I know I'm on the desert. I mean, I'm in the desert, but I'm comfortable. And I've gotten used to my life. And that seems a little bit hard. And I don't care if I have to live like this. I just don't want to do that. You ever been the just let me do my thing? Yeah. Now, I do notice that this gives me comfort as a parent. Because it says, then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. So I kind of feel justified when my kids give me six excuses for being frustrated with them. Because the Lord was like, come on, Moses. Don't you get it? 
I, the one who calls you, am going to make it happen in you and for you. <laughs> he even says, I'll, okay, Moses, I'll give you Aaron to go with you. Which actually ended up not being a great thing. You realize that? Like, God sometimes gives us what we want, but it's not the best thing. It, actually, historians will tell you that it had been better if it had just been Moses. Because Aaron did some kind of shady things. The Lord's like, Moses, I, I want you to go. And you're just excuse after excuse, and I keep answering your excuses. Well, here, just let Moses go. I would say it's just the lesson is, it's just better to just obey than, than negotiate with God, right? But the point of the story is, this is the man who we're talking about over 5,000 years later. Who wasn't unlike you and me. Who sat before the Lord and told the Lord every which way why he couldn't be used. I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I just want to do my thing, Lord. And God wouldn't let him go. He just kept, well, that's an excuse, but that's what it is. Here's what I can do. You think Moses would have said, just send somebody else, Lord, if he'd have known what the next 40 years of his life would have been? No way. No way. He'd be like, sign me up right now. I think if you could see what God can do through you, you'd be sign me up right now. But he wants us just today to have faith, to trust him. To say, Lord, I don't feel like I'm worthy or deserving or able or talented or capable enough. But you're calling, and because you're calling, you're going to do the same thing in my life that you did in Moses. You're going to give me purpose, and you're going to help me be salt and light in a world that, that needs it desperately. We stand this morning. I just want to have a moment where I want to pray with you. And I know if you're like me, this week I have felt the conviction of the Lord. And I realize that still at times, even though I'm in vocational ministry, it's, it's easy to de default to excuses. Why I'm not good enough, not talented enough. Why I'm... And yet my prayer is today that all of us would see that the Lord... Basically said, guys, it never was about your ability. It's always about my ability. I just need you to go. What's crazy is the ride Moses got to go on for 40 years. Because he went, he's no doubt like now, wow, that was the greatest decision I ever made. It'll be the greatest decision you make. To just go. To just obey to just lean into God's purpose for your life. Father, I pray as we go from this place that the life of Moses would be such an encouragement to us. It would instruct us. Lord, the human condition is often to not see what you see, to not value what you value, to see ourselves as not capable, as not useful. Lord, that is not true. Moses was just like us. Lord, help us to say yes. Help us to go. However your spirit is applying that in our own lives, I don't know. I know it's in my life what you're saying to me, but just Lord, help me. Help us. I'm confident it'll be the best decisions we ever make. And we'll look back and have no regrets. Thank you, Lord.
We praise you. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. And all would say, amen. Thank you this morning. Go be blessed in this week.